I'm going to introduce who all our speakers are together, and then they'll come on one by one. So we have, looking at primary care, we have Professor Richard Hobbs, who's the chair of the European Primary Care Cardiovascular Society, the president of the International Primary Care um, Society, and the professor of primary care for the University of Oxford. He will be followed by Professor Lina Badimun, who's going to address secondary care. And she is the director for cardiovascular science program and cardiovascular disease area, and the coordinator for the Hospital of San Paolo, Barcelona, our, our hosting city and a former chair of the ESC Advocacy Committee and the ESC Patient Forum. Our, our third speaker, we are absolutely delighted, and we extend a very warm welcome because he stepped in at the last minute um, on behalf of Professor Ushmanovitz, who was unable to attend because of a family issue. So thank you particularly for stepping in at the last minute. But Professor Knut Borg Jonsson is a pro emeritus professor and a medical advisor to the World Diabetes Federation. And our last speaker will be helping us to explore the issue of social determinants of health, which is so crucial. We heard it highlighted throughout this morning, and that's Dr. Ratni Devi, who is the chair of the ISPOR Patient Council, that's the Professional Society for Health Economics and Outcomes Research, the lead of the Indian Alliance of Patient Groups, and the immediate past president of the International Association of Patient Organizations. So we have a fantastic panel who are going to help us understand this issue. How do we go back to basics and this time get them right? So let me invite our first speaker, and that's Richard, to come forward. And we've asked each of them to have a short presentation, which is going to be kicked off with a question. I have my first question, which is, where do the opportunities to better detect CVD exist in the primary care setting? Okay, well, um, obviously the answer to that is there are many opportunities in primary care um, to get detection. I think some aspects of cardiovascular disease requires formal identification or screening, um, such as doing uh, that would require a blood test, for example. So screening for lipids uh, needs to be on a formal basis. But there's lots of opportunities to do things opportunistically because patients are coming up for other problems, it takes a second to touch a pulse, uh, for example, and uh, sometimes I think it'll be simple opportunistic additions that are part of the consultation. So that would be my answer to your question. But let's have a look at some missed opportunities. And I'm not actually going to provide uh, too many solutions to you, because frankly, if there were a lot of solutions, we wouldn't be having this meeting. Um, and what I'm going to do is, I think, pose some issues for us. And uh, I'm sure in the groups, you're going to come up with the sort of dynamic um, suggestions you've already done so. I think there are some solutions, but they need a lot more. And the one thing that we should take away from this meeting is that there is no magic bullet here. There is no one way we're going to solve this. It'll be multiple and sometimes small incremental steps that uh, get us on a better place. This is just to remind us that cardiovascular disease remains the most important cause of death. It's not just death, though. It's premature death. We've all got to die from something, but we don't want to die prematurely. And we've already heard today about the impacts of premature death on those that are left behind and the impact that has both on individuals' futures lives, but also their health in the holistic sense, which includes mental health and um, social um, outcomes. But ischemic heart disease, stroke and diabetes, number three there, you, you probably can't see on the right what's changed. And in fact, there is improvement. So we shouldn't be going away from here thinking we've failed completely, because things would be much worse if health systems actually hadn't started introducing preventive activity. And for ischemic heart disease and stroke, there have actually been quite significant improvements in the levels of those in society. But the big problem is some of the risk factors are getting more prevalent. Diabetes, kidney disease is getting more prevalent in people between 50 and 74, and similarly in the more elderly. I also want to stress the fact that these issues around vascular health are critical for health systems. And COVID 
basically demonstrated the health of populations on the planet. It was a stress test for health systems, and most health systems were found wanting. Why? Because COVID had uh, particularly adverse effects on frail elderly and people with established disease and established risk factors that were not being well controlled. And these are UK data. It would have been the same in any European country where the yellow are the deaths related directly to COVID. And you can see that they were confined to wave one and wave two. And once we had the vaccines, basically there were few deaths that were exclusively related to COVID. And the dark gray there are deaths due to ischemic heart disease. So people were dying principally of ischemic heart disease. And the other takeaway point is that that dotted line there, which you might be able to see, is the five-year average. So anything above that line represents excess deaths on the five-year average, lots of excess deaths. Most of them weren't COVID. Most of them were cardiovascular. And it's persisted. That's up until May 23. And we've still got excess uh, mortality in the United Kingdom. And it's principally driven by underlying vascular risk factors that haven't been adequately detected. So this is a really big public health issues for countries. And yes, we should be investing in pandemic um, preparedness and vaccine capacity, etc. But we've missed the most important point is that if we don't get the basic health in the population better, then the population is susceptible to future pandemics. And the basics are that it is actually relatively simple because we have the biggest evidence base in medicine about what drives vascular risk and its traditional risk factors, its blood pressure. And we have even better data showing that if you treat it effectively, you will halve the rates of stroke in society. You will reduce heart failure by about 25% and all other vascular outcomes. And the same with lipids, it's a major risk factor if you treat it effectively. For every one millimole reduction in LDL, you'll get a 20% reduction in major vascular events. So the more you reduce it, the bigger the effect size. And it's the same with smoking. Um, if you have to smoke, do it for a short period of time because it's never too late to stop never too late to stop. You will always derive some benefit. These are um, mortality benefits. Um, so yeah, it's always worth stopping smoking, even if you take it up later in life. And I think the one, one I'd really want to emphasize, though, is dietary modification. We do have an evidence base around more effective interventions for weight control now. And it's key, because this is the risk factor that is on the increase. These are data showing that if you're on the 95th centile, the top end of weight, BMI, in adolescence, you've got 10 times the rate likelihood of developing vascular disease as uh, an adult uh, compared to those that have a low BMI. So this is the big risk factor that we're going to have to think about in the future. And the take-home message is we are doing OK, actually. The blue line are risk factors that are better managed now than they were um, previously. But uh, what we have in the red are risk factors that are getting worse. And we've got BMI, we've got particulate pollution, and we've got fasting glucose on the increase. And we still aren't treating hypertension quite as well as we could do. What solutions? As I say, no magic bullet. It's going to be incremental. We need to diagnose people with risk factors. The most important thing then, though, is you, you don't not follow them up. You need support, repeated messaging. You need to equip people with the ability to manage their own problems. We need to redesign societies. Um, we need to think about the way we design buildings. We encourage people to use cycles to work. There's nowhere to leave your cycle. You can't have a shower. It's crazy. So we really need to think about practicing the design of societies that we want for the future. It's not just doctors. It's not just nurses. It's not just patients. It's politicians as well. Food policies, 
taxation policies. The European Union still subsidizes tobacco farming. So we need to stop the silly things and get on and make it easier for people to do things that are actually quite difficult, like changing behavior. We've already mentioned this. This is just one additional solution to think about, which is more patient self-management, equipping patients with the means for managing their own uh, major problems. This is work we've done a lot of work around patient self-management in Oxford. And we've shown that if you provide validated blood uh, machines and algorithms that show how you manage, uh, alter your medication personally on the basis of an algorithm that supports you, that you can actually get over a 12 month period, which then persists a five millimeter better reduction in blood pressure than the control group, which is usual care. And it was a dominant strategy because they used healthcare less. It was actually less expensive. These data were used by the UK during the pandemic. A lot of devices were sent out to patients to manage their own illness. We've done it in women who are post-pregnancy um, because the biggest cause of death, still maternal death, in much of the world is uh, high blood pressure, preeclampsia. We've shown that you can actually manage this yourself. So I think this is going to be part of the solutions as well. So it's detection, it's follow-up, it's patient education, it's tools that enable people who are prepared to do it to manage themselves, and there's a huge amount of public messaging to stop all of the false news out there and uh, help patients equip them with the proper news. Thank you very much. And I've got a question for Lena now, which yes. is what role does secondary care play in CVD diagnosis? Lena. Thank you. Well, Yes. <laughs> well, CBD diagnosis uh, plays a significant role, a very important role. So let me tell you, I'm very pleased to be here. When Olive invited me, I, I thought that maybe I couldn't be here because I had other commitments. Everybody is meeting today, you know? It's unbelievable, so many activities on the same day. But then I decided to really join you because, I mean, the issue here, the mission and the vision is very important. And then it was really Jay saying, only 10 minutes I have to speak. I mean, once I come here, I like to be. <laughs> so I'm going to be concentrating my 10 minutes. I think that, well, it was already said. I was, uh, uh, during my time working for the European Society of Cardiology, I was the chair of the advocacy committee first and afterwards of the patient forum. And I understood the necessities and the feelings and the emotions of patients that suffer from cardiovascular disease uh, ailments and how they need to really be um, reassured that everybody is working for the same end, for the benefit of the patients. I work here at the Hospital of San Pablo in Barcelona. This is my, my declaration of interest. I uh, do some advisory work and I have research grants from the European Union, also national funds and I have created a startup company for innovation. So it is true that in my 10 minutes I have to talk about diagnosis in secondary prevention. So secondary prevention, primary prevention, usually now we are working with the concept that there is no such a boundary that patients should be uh, really treated accordingly to the, the possibility of developing disease from the very beginning. And this is a continuum of, of cardiovascular disease prevention. Uh, but nevertheless, so if we concentrate in secondary prevention, is, these are patients that come already with a diagnosis that have had an event, a previous event, that was really saying, hey, I have a problem in my vascular system that has uh, produced uh, an, an ACS, for example, right? Or has produced her failure has produced an event. So in reality, cardiac rehabilitation is important. It's important because it's a prevention, uh, a short prevention to prevent recurrent events. And this is important. Not all hospitals have units for rehabilitation. And this is something you have to fight for. To have all hospitals in, in all your countries, to have rehabilitation units that are going to take care of the whole care of a patient that comes after an event. 
And this means a lot of, uh, a lot of detection on many different issues with diagnosis and also with that are biochemical analysis, but also with other concepts that are equally important. So from the psychosocial support, this is very important. And this can be done from a, a rehabilitation unit. From a physical exercise, already mentioned. Smoking cessation, already mentioned. So the optimization of uh, blood pressure, already mentioned. Uh, the lipid levels, the glycemic control, all these also affects primary prevention, right? When we use the old categorization. But also <coughs> regulation of body weight, all these events, education of risk factors, and also nutritional advice. All known by you, right? But when they are done together, they have a better um, possibility of solving the, the problem of a patient than if you go one by one. And going one by one, you can solve some of the problems, but not all. That's why I really recommend to fight for cardiac rehabilitation units in the different hospitals. Now, if we consider this uh, pyramid of uh, thinking what's primary, secondary. I mean, the treatments are already known. I'm not going to speak about treatments because this was not the purpose, it was diagnosis. But the treatments are really there. They have to be used. They have to be well prescribed by the physician and well taken by the patient. And the patient should be empowered to take care of their own health. And that's important. This is also for the future. So how can you do that with education? So if the physician takes time to educate the patient, the patient will know what has to be done. I think this is an important issue to be taken uh, seriously. Now, what uh, predictors we have of a, of a recurrent cardiac event? What can we measure? That was the question that was posed to me. Obviously, lipids, hypertension, uh, the, um, uh, glucose or uh, glycated hemoglobin, lifestyle, what's your lifestyle, age, Age, you, you, you tell me the, your age and I'll tell you that possibly you have a higher risk. Obesity, extent of severity of atherosclerosis, this goes in the area of imaging. Many hospitals have imaging, not GPs, as was discussed before here, but yet the tertiary hospital has have, uh, the possibility of um, investigating the severity of atherosclerosis. Uh, comorbidities, that we'll be discussed later on. And clinical biomarkers, not many, because clinical biomarkers, there is a lot of research. My group is involved in this research as well. As well. But we have now standardized troponin, CRP, anti pro -BMP. Interleukin-6 is coming in different studies. These are biomarkers that can be used to predict the possibility of having a re-event. They go around inflammation, about uh, the function of the heart by the, the, the pro -BMP, and also troponin that tells you if you have a necrosis in your heart. So therefore, these are the clinical markers that are used. They are standardized to be used clinically. All the others are research. And innovation should be really reinforced to find more biomarkers. And then social determinants, that is, is interview, and the polygenic risk score. What is genetic here? So genetics, unfortunately, are starting to help, but not too much. So when there are studies well conducted, comparing the polygenic risk score, the contribution to the evaluation of risk, sometimes they give a little bit more in the, in the, in the when we do the rock curves to, to identify the risk, little more than all the other factors, the classical risk factors. Therefore, we have to look for more indicators that are associated not only with, with the genes and the, the genetics, but also with epigenetics. And I think that, in my case, uh, we are looking for epigenetic regulators of disease. And in familial hypercholesterolemia, we know, for example, that siblings, one has disease when they are uh, 40, and the other doesn't. And why is that? It should be epigenetic regulation. And we are st st studying this, because this goes in the realm of precision medicine. If we understand why between siblings there is this difference uh, in the presentation of disease, maybe we will understand better for the general population, not only people with FH. So there, is, there are efforts out there that want to really advance. And I want to mention one that was already mentioned also. It was that the dietary habits. We know the, 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 we have tables uh, regarding the presentation of disease around Europe or the, the world. 
And we know that the Mediterranean diet is, uh, shows pre prevention of disease presentation. This is the, the, the PREDIMED study in, prim in primary prevention that show very, very good data in 2018 regarding the reduction of stroke and also myocardial infarction. But now we have data coming this year in which we have published that uh, a diet that is a Mediterranean-like diet also has power to reduce presentations of re-events in the secondary prevention realm. Therefore, this data was published this, the last year in Lancet. is really significant, telling you that you have to keep a good diet, not only to prevent the, 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 the development of disease, but also for the progression of disease. And I see apples here in the table. I celebrate that, <laughs> that thing because it's very nice. It's nice to see that this is, because this is the Mediterranean diet, a variety of diet, including fruits and vegetables. And this is something we have to teach our children because this is a benefit for the future. And I'll finish with something that I think is important also. We are learning that we have to give importance to the patient-reported outcomes, the pros. This is something that is relatively new. These are outcomes, this, this, this pros uh, should have a role in the quality and care of management. Because when we ask the patients what's the feeling they have regarding management, regarding treatments. If we include this in our evaluation of certain drugs, for example, this will be a benefit for everybody. And I think the components of PRO are symptoms, are functional status, health-related quality of life, overall quality of life, health behavior, experiences with care, how the, the patient feel about the care we are giving them. So this is important. And the benefit will come not only from a, a, a product that is very good, but also a product that is very, very well felt by the patient when the patient takes it, for example, if we talk about the drug. Therefore, the, here is a line of work that will give a lot of benefit for, to everybody working in medicine. And uh, the, the, I want to finish by two things. One is that the ecosystem model of health determinants is being enlarged, right? We have to include diversity. We have to, to include inequalities of treatment. This is happening continuously. And we haven't cared too much until recently. Now in trials, we are trying to, to have these con, this concerns and trying to have people recruited in trials that are not all white Europeans. We have to include everybody. And I think this also will improve care because then we'll have information of the diversity of patients that can be treated by a certain treatment. And I think that people is in the center and this is what we really should uh, take into account. I already mentioned lifestyle. Obviously, this is the key issue because it's not only obesity. It's that depending on what you eat, you will have a healthier vascular bed or not healthier vascular bed. So obesity is a sign of your, the intake of calories, but also you can be thin and you have cardiovascular disease. So this is not the only measure, right? So I think that this is my last one, the barriers to cardiac rehabilitation in low and middle income countries. And I think this is really important because we have realized that when we complain in Europe, the situation is much worse in other places. Women had this problem and we, start, we, we keep working about women's health this is not over, right? Because the trials initially were all male, white male. Now it's white and, and, and <laughs> women and, and men. But, but the still, women's health is very important, and we should keep working on this in the cardiovascular area. But we have to extend this to other societies, other etnias that are even underrepresented even more than we are. I don't have the time to say everything. I have the red here. You see, I told you 10 minutes was not enough. When I come, I come here to see you, but this is my hospital. You should visit the Hospital of San Pablo. This is a, is a UNESCO uh, building. Uh, it's, a, it's marvelous. Uh, now we don't work here. This is a kept for uh, these historical buildings. We have the campus in the north part of these buildings, but they are marvelous. So thank you very much. I have really liked being here. And now, now I have a question. I have a question for Dr. Borsch uh, Johnson. And the question is, certain diseases come in clusters. So cardiovascular disease is an area where there is uh, usually multimorbidity, right? So do you think that health systems adequately address this factor in policies and procedures for detecting and diagnosis cardiovascular disease? Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, my background for answering this question is slightly different from most of you. I'm not to the same extent been in cardiovascular disease. I've mainly been working in the field of diabetes uh, and in public health and epidemiology. And then for the last 10 to 15 years before retirement, I worked in hospital management. And I have to say that hospital management learned me that um, what I knew already, that guideline, no guideline is self-implementing. That is even more true when patients are suffering from one disease. Healthcare systems are not organized in a way to handle patients that, uh, or individuals that are suffering from more than one condition. We are trained in silos, we're working in silos, um, and that is how we see the individual in front of us as a part of that silo, and we do not look outside that silo. And the important thing is that heart disease is very rarely a lonely rider. It very often comes not only with complications to the specific uh, disease, but also comes together with a variety of other non-communicable diseases. We often see it as a single event, but that is not the way it is. That is why the concept of multimorbidity is getting more and more attention, um, both scientifically and clinically. Multimorbidity refers to the, co the coexistence of two or more long-term chronic diseases in one individual. That could be, for instance, diabetes or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and CVD occurring in the same individual. Comorbidity is, by definition, something different. <coughs> that is consequences of the primary disease. You have Heart, you have uh, hypertension, and then as a consequence of that, you may develop a stroke or a heart attack or other diseases. So for comorbidity, there is an index disease in the center, which in this case would be, for instance, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, that would lead to a variety of other conditions, kidney failure, uh, peripheral atherosclerosis, etc. But that is foreseeable still within the same silo. The other thing, the other situation is where you have more than one chronic disease at the same time because they will have different effects. And the effect on the individual is a combination of all these different diseases in the same individual. And we are never trained, we've never been trained to see that combination. We've never been trained to treat that combination. Multiplicity is a consequence to a very large extent of age. The older we get, the higher the risk of having two or more chronic conditions. By the age of uh, something like uh, 60 years, it will be just about 20% of the population having two or more chronic diseases. And that increases very rapidly thereafter. By 80, 80 years, it's in the order of um, 40%. And it, as all with all other conditions, has a very strong uh, social determinant. The probability of having multimorbidity is much, much higher in the lowest socioeconomic groups than in the highest socioeconomic groups. And this is a slight, slightly complicated slide, but the key message is that for the same level of, um, of for the same prevalence of, um, of uh, multimorbidity, if you are in the high socioeconomic groups, you develop it 15 to 20 years later than those in the lower socioeconomic groups. And at any age, the probability of having multimorbidity is twice as high in the low socioeconomic groups than it would be for the high socioeconomic groups. So that alone identifies one of the key factors that we need to look into when we 
are uh, looking into these multimorbid patients. And the second slide, uh, which is difficult to read, but it is what are the combinations we are looking at. And again, the light blue bumps are the high socioeconomic groups. The dark blue bumps are the low socioeconomic groups. The size of the bump means how frequent is it. And what you'll see from the pattern in the, in the picture is that for, for any combination of different diseases, the prevalence is much higher, uh, the probability of having the combination is much higher in the lower socioeconomic groups. So what is the com what's the consequence of this when we see it from the patient perspective? First of all, that we need to recognize that heart disease is often a part of a cluster. Secondly, that that has implications for screening and diagnosis. We have a lot of patients going to the pulmonary unit, to the endocrine unit, to other units with a chronic disease. But they are not systematically being screened for cardiovascular disease. The doctors there have never been trained to think in those terms, and therefore late diagnosis is the most likely uh, event to happen. Secondly, treatment, when we come, once it has been diagnosed, treatment of individuals with multimorbidity is complicated because we are treating different diseases with different drugs that very often interact. Um, and thirdly, the organization of care um, really creates a lot of problem, and I'll come back to that in a second. When it comes to the screening and diagnosis, the important thing is that we need not only to have the national, the regional, and the local guidelines, we need these to be known, not only by the health professionals, but also by the individuals suffering from the disease. Because otherwise, they are never going to be implemented. So therefore, the guidelines need not only to be written and, um, and um, known by the health professionals, the creation has to be a co-creation together with patient organizations, and um, we, need, we need the patient organization's pressure to actually implement these, um, uh, these uh, guidelines. And very briefly on treatment, that, as I said, the problem here is that we very often end up in what is called polypharmacy, individuals having to take anywhere between five and 15 pills per day, sometimes even more. No clinician, no doctor can foresee the interaction between such a wide variety of drugs. So there, has been, there will have to be solutions found to this where rational pharmacotherapy is being uh, considered. Um, but also that a prioritization of the intervention has to be made together with the individual with the diseases. What is most important to you actually being the individual with these diseases? And then there's the entire issue of organization of care. Who should treat these patients? Is it still the right thing to keep it in silos? and uh, to ensure the highest level of technical competence within each area? Or do we need to think in terms of new ways of organizing care? We tried that in my own hospital by establishing um, what, is, what was called a common medical unit, uh, outpatient unit, where the doctors had to interact and where an, uh, a patient could never be sent back to the general practitioner for readmission to another uh, speciality that had to be done within the unit. It was a good idea. It is very, very difficult to implement, but I'm still sure that some way down that path would be the right thing, to, the, the right way to go. Mm -hmm. That is something um, you also should involve yourself in. Um, how do you see the best organization of care? Um, what is the best idea 
from the perspective of the individual living with these diseases. This is what I want to say today. Uh, thank you. And as the previous speaker, surprisingly, I've also been given a question for the last speaker of today uh, for Ratna TV. I believe you have worked extensively with communities and in the field. What, in your experience, are the three most contributing factors to CVD burden, and how do social determinants of health affect the early detection and diagnosis of CVD? Good afternoon, and thank you for that question. Um, I've just recovered from a viral fever, so please forgive my throat. Um, I also travel 14 hours and then woke up at 12.30 a.m., which is 5 o'clock back home. So if I don't sound coherent, please forgive me. So uh, we're talking about social determinants, and some of these things have been referred to in the morning um, sessions as well as in our group work. Um, just a small example. Um, we had four lived experiences sharing their experiences in the morning session. All of them are educated and had access to health care and they, they had delayed diagnosis or misdiagnosis, but they did go to a doctor. Think about a situation where the person is illiterate, um, doesn't have access to a doctor. They won't even report to the system. So how do you then detect these people and what in the context of early diagnosis and treatment can we talk about? So what are those factors that actually uh, determine whether the person seeks health care or not? And if those factors are important to us, uh, how do we then address those factors? So in the morning, Professor Lawrence mentioned that Barcelona's AQI is 55, Delhi is 535. And no one has control on that. We all live in those conditions. We, we wake up every morning to those conditions, to those smoggy conditions. We go to work. We commute in public transport. And those are some of the biggest risk factors over which we have no control. And it's not just telling many big cities have a similar situation. Again, another example, I, I live in a gated community where we have um, security guards. And these people work 12-hour shifts. And that's how it is um, you know, positioned in our country. They work 12-hour shifts. They are paid just above the minimum wage level. And they work seven days because they are not entitled to more than one day per month as leave. And if they fall sick, they, they live in a slum situation, which is like a make-believe um, or a, or a you know, uh, temporary shelter. Um, they have large families uh, because they believe that children who are in the workforce will bring more money home. And they do not have, though the government has a, a health insurance scheme for, scheme for them, many of them do not want to go to the hospitals because it would mean a loss of, uh, you know, one day's wages. So think of that person having a heart disease, trying to report to the system and getting the access that we are talking about. So we are talking of a country of 1.4 billion, and just Delhi has 32 million. We don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough hospitals, we do not have enough pharmacies, and we do not have enough finances to be able to manage the burden of cardiovascular care. So where do we start? And what are the, some of the factors that actually, you know, um, are exacerbating, exacerbating uh, CVDs in the context of some of the low and middle income countries and middle income countries? And that's where I come from, so I'm speaking about that. So this is not a picture that I made. I picked it up from AHA, and it perfectly describes some of the chronic um, you know, situations that lead to chronic inflammations that exacerbate the CVD conditions. So you're talking of economic stability. And as I just mentioned, if you do not have a job that pays you every month, you don't know where your health care is going to come from because you do not have your health insurance as well because probably your um, employer is not providing you and you have to pay out of pocket. You have a neighborhood and built environment which is not clean, which doesn't give you... Um, so many of these people who live in these uh, uh, shift houses also use solid fuels like wood and uh, dung cakes. So they have um, ambient, you know, indoor pollution as well. 
Um, then they have poor education, access, and quality. So many of these uh, are school dropouts. So they do not understand, even if you have educational material on healthcare, they do not understand that unless it is picture material or interactive material. Um, as I said before, they have poor healthcare access and, uh, uh, and to quality healthcare, especially. They may be going to um, unqualified healthcare practitioners because they are cheaper and faster, but the, the formal healthcare system is not easily accessible. Sometimes the government provides uh, healthcare access, but they are too busy or, or too crowded, and therefore patients don't want to go there, especially for screening. If they are sick, they will go there, but for screening purposes, they will definitely not go there. And then um, in many of these uh, you know, communities, there is violence, uh, especially at home. Um, there, there is fights, there is violence, there is abuse. And all of these lead to a lot of mental health issues that then increase the stress and lead to hypertension and other uh, chronic conditions. <laughs> So as I said, the chronic psychosocial and economic stressors are built into the social determinants. And unless we alleviate those social determinants, it's hard to talk about diagnostics access and treatment access because you might put in all the medicines and diagnostics uh, that are possible into the hospitals, but unless you are removing these factors, they are not going to go anywhere. And I'm going to present that as part of one of my case studies. So what, the, what does this lead to? It leads to low socioeconomic status. It leads to uh, neighborhood violence, as I said. It le leads to limited healthcare access. It leads to early childhood adversity. And some of these children are from broken families, have chronic stress. Um, they do not have. One of the important things that I did not mention here is uh, mobility. And I see this in many countries where young populations are moving because of education as well as workforce. And because they are moving from uh, one city to another or one country to another, the healthcare systems are not friendly and they do not have access to the whole gamut of healthcare services. And we do not talk of this when we talk of uh, you know, uh, healthcare access. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, you know, um, racial as well as uh, other forms of discrimination. We also talked about gender in the morning. And we know that uh, where healthcare is out of pocket, the financial decision is not with the woman in the family, it's with the men who are the earning members. And therefore, very often, even though they are suffering, they are not given the opportunity to visit a healthcare provider. And they usually try with traditional uh, you know, medicines. Uh, we talked about unsafe or insecure housing. We talked about transportation and noise exposure. Again, this is a big problem in many cities. Uh, food insecurity, so we talk of healthy foods, but are the people able to buy those healthy foods? Is it affordable? Is it available? So in many communities, um, there is affordability, but the, the availability is not there. So how do you buy food when it is not even available in your markets? And then a lot of social isolation happening with families becoming nuclear, so there is nobody to share your distress with, and therefore they just sit at home and decay, but they do not access healthcare, and unless there is a critical situation where somebody comes. And this happens mostly in the aged, um, where people are alone because children have migrated out of homes, and they are sick, but they don't know who to go and talk to or how to uh, you know, um, address that. They do not have transportation. They cannot drive on their own, and therefore they end up with a heart attack or stroke, and that's when a neighbor or somebody from the emergency department comes and takes them. So I talked about um, the, the various factors, and uh, if you were to put them into three buckets, then uh, the socio-political and economic context would talk about the economic stability, which is the ability to pay for healthcare, um, the educational access and the quality of uh, healthcare, uh, as well as the neighborhood and built uh, environments. How do we give affordable housing to people so that they are not living in shanties and slums? How do you build healthcare closer to people? So I will again talk about it more in my um, case study. And then the structural discrimination and uh, racism. So there are certain biases built within, um, within healthcare providers where if somebody who is not properly dressed walked, you know, they already uh, in their minds have built up a, a sort of a, a picture that this person is an alcoholic or uh, comes from a background where they cannot pay. 
um, and they do not offer the entire basket of services. Uh, and I've seen this, uh, you know, where, uh, when they are offering, say, stents or surgeries. So they assume that the person cannot pay or is not able to afford that care, and therefore they just give a medical management and will not offer the surgical procedure without even asking the patient whether the person would like to undergo a surgery. Then we talked about the social and community context, and we, I, I talked about healthy, um, you know, shifting to healthy agriculture. How do we do that so that there is more production of healthy food and it's available in local markets? How do we uh, improve social environment and cohesion, the law and regulatory agencies so that there is less violence and other uh, risk factors within the community? How do we make transportation available? And this is another thing that um, one of my case studies will come across. We work in stroke, and we found out that though we have accredited stroke units, we do not have transportation to manage the patient to reach the hospital on time. So strokes usually happen at the middle of the night or early morning, and you don't have, um, say, a 911 kind of a system, or even if you have it, it doesn't reach you because there are too few. So you have these critical golden hours, and if you're not reaching a stroke at accredited hospital within those four hours or six hours, then you have lost the opportunity. So how do you get the transportation to work in your favor? Um, also, how do you, um, you know, I know that in my part of the country, most people don't invest in health insurance. So how do you make people invest in health insurance so that the financial risks are minimized? Uh, and how do you give uh, housing stability so that people are able to live in a more um, healthy environment? I'm not talking of the climate and all that because that is at the political level. So from the lived experience, and we've been hearing about this since morning, uh, there is everyday st stigma and discrimination for many people, uh, especially if they have multiple adversities. So they're born into broken families, they're living in slums, they do not have a regular job, they have an alcoholic father, and, and they are then sort of typecasted into a specific bucket, and these people are then discriminated and do not reach, uh, reach healthcare, or even if they reach, they're not offered the full uh, gamut of services. Then there are perceptions in neighborhoods. So if you are in a slum, then uh, you, you know you have a different kind of access. If you are in a high-rise society, you have a different kind of access. And uh, you see that even in transport systems. So if I you know call for an Uber, it will it will refuse to go to a slum, but it will come to the high-rise society. So it, the same thing will happen for an ambulance as well. Partly because it's difficult to navigate those lanes and go there, and therefore they do not want to waste their time going for one patient, whereas they can do five patients in the same time that they go to their slum. So how do you improve you know, road systems? How do you improve transportation facilities? How do you improve health literacy? And again, I will refer to this. You know, Most health uh, messages are in English or one of the most common spoken languages of the country, whereas people speak different dialects and have different cultural contexts in which they understand those messages. And unless you customize those messages so that people can understand, they will uh, reject them. They will not even look at them. And then we talked about social needs and perceived health status. Um, so I will now come to uh, something, oh, I'm already um, against time. So I will quickly go through the, um, the study that I was talking about. In India, we have something called the India Hypertension Control Initiative, which is a nationwide initiative to screen population below 35 years for diabetes and hypertension. And uh, after they had finished five years, they came up with a report which said that only 27% had their hypertension under control, and 47% of people never returned back for a, um, for a follow-up over those five years. So we went down to the field to find out what's happening. Why are people not coming? Because medication is free, doctors are available, primary health cares are within walking distance, but still people are not reporting. So um, we found that 100% of respondents are aware of what hypertension, whether in uh, English or in local dialect, but they could not, 40% could not name the risk factors and complications that arise from them. So, so most of them thought this is something that you have to live lifelong with and you can manage with diet and traditional medicine or by stopping, say, tobacco use. 
Uh, a large portion of male respondents use tobacco and alcohol regularly, and the number of liquor stores have grown fourfold in the last two years. So while the number of hospitals remain the same, the liquor stores have multiplied four times more, which means there is more e easy access to alcohol. Most respondents are unaware of age-appropriate blood pressure, so um, they did not know that if you are 80, then um, you have a different cutoff, as opposed to 35, where you have a different cutoff, and if you are above that, then you have to go and have a regular checkup. Almost all respondents have never gone for preventive screening, and we know that from various studies already. About 30% had various myths and misconceptions, including hypertension being harmless and something that happens to everybody with age. And this was more about uh, people about 60 years. They felt this is something that happens to everyone, uh, especially if they have double vision or headache or feel sick or are unable to breathe or take stairs. They say it's a it's a property of aging and nothing to do with their health condition. About 50% never went back for a follow-up. Now, all primary healthcare centers had IC material on hypertension. IC is information, education, communication, but it was on the walls and nobody was reading it. And uh, obviously, all the preventive messages were going waste because it was a big poster on the wall, but people just walked into the, cl the clinician's cabin, had their medicine or prescription and just walked out. Nobody looked at the wall. All the primary healthcare centers had NCD registers maintained by the auxiliary nurse midwives, but these were all kept as handwritten documents, so it was impossible to track and trace. Uh, messages on adherence and follow-up were not present at all. So many of the people who felt better after two or three months actually stopped their medicines and didn't go back to the doctors. Now, 80% of villagers said the primary health um, center had, was within the walkable distance and reaching it was easy. However, less than 30% said they went to the PSC at the onset of symptoms. So those who did recognize that they had a fainting attack or something didn't go to the primary health center. Now, most primary health care centers could not offer the doctors uh, the, the tests that were prescribed by the doctors and the referral systems, both forward and backward, were not very well established. There were very strong myths and misconceptions within the community that medicines are need, need to be taken only when sick. Medicines are hot, and this hot and cold system exists in uh, many countries. And uh, therefore, if you take it for too long, there is dependency, so you should discontinue at some point of time. And that if you stop your risk factors, then you don't need to take medicines. And that alternate systems of medicines are better. So I'm going to stop there. I can see the signal. So, <laughs> so these are some of the pictures uh, from our field work, and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you.